presenter and keynote, Alice Holleran. She's the executive director of Audubon Society here in Colorado. I met Allison uh, this spring at a water uh, conference held by Boulder Rights of Nature and immediately introduced her to the idea of a climate summit and getting involved. And we've been able to maintain a connection. But what's become apparent is, is the challenges that we face with habitat in Colorado and the effects of increased population as well as um, pollution and warming temperatures. Recently, Audubon has taken a charge, taken the charge that makes the global climate crisis on a local level their priority. Allison Holler. Thank you, Bob. I think I should have um, thought about my outfit a little bit more today. I've got to hook my mic onto my boot. Um, <clears throat> So that excludes any dancing that I will be doing this afternoon. Um, thank you again for inviting me to speak this morning um, addressing global climate change, something Audubon is getting into relatively recently. Before I launch into my uh, diatribe here, I want to give you a little bit of background about Audubon. I am the executive director of Audubon Rockies. We're a regional office of the National Audubon Society, which is headquarters in New York City. There are nine chapter, Audubon chapters in Colorado, one of them right here in Boulder, the Boulder County Audubon chapter. If you don't know about them, they do a lot of great things really locally. I work within two states, Colorado and Wyoming. So let me see if I can, oh, that one, yay. Really what Audubon is all about is a voice for the birds. You heard about the Lorax and they speak for the trees. We speak for the birds. We let birds tell us where we should be working, how we should be working, who we should be working with. A little bit about the National Audubon Society from who I work. We've been around for a little while, just over 100 years, actually. The Audubon Society was formed in 1905 based on the decimation of uh, birds for their plumage. Basically, ladies love to put dead birds on their hats their purses, seems a little weird, but it was actually, uh, yeah. But sometimes I look at fashion today and I think, not so weird. Um, <clears throat> so a group of women actually started the Audubon Society and, uh, you know, got it off the ground. We were successful in passing the Audubon Plumage Law in 1910 in direct response for killing those uh, shorebirds and neotropical migrants. We were an integral part of the, part of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918, which still stands today, which is why you cannot shoot those uh, um, <clears throat> birds that come in huge flocks and poop on your car. I can't tell you how many calls I get about Brewer's Blackbirds. They're all over the place and they're pooping on my car. What can I do? Nothing, because they're protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. We also established the first two bird sanctuaries in the US, the Paul J. Rainey Sanctuary and the Teddy Roosevelt Sanctuary which are still standing today as well. We have a long history of speaking for the birds. <clears throat> and I think this is one thing that Audubon brings to bear that not a lot of other groups can do. We are a grassroots organization. We over, have over 100 years of bringing people together because of birds. We have over 800,000 members and supporters. 800,000 across the US. We have 467 chapters, nine of them right here in Colorado. Over almost 2 million people read our magazine. So just writing an article in the magazine reaches a lot of people. We have over a million people visit our nature centers across the US. And we also work internationally. So we work with Pro Natura in Central America. We work with our Canadian counterparts as well because birds aren't constrained by boundaries, state boundaries or national boundaries. <clears throat> and this last one, the 47 million US birders in the world, that's a key one. That's our potential membership. It crosses political values, it crosses gender and race, everyone. I can't think of anyone that really hates birds. Some people are a little freaked out by them. 
But these people are the potential recruits for our climate initiative as well. No matter if they're a Republican, Democrat, male, female, black, white, Asian, whatever. These people like birds, and that's where we come in. That's Audubon's unique role, that we are able to cross those boundaries and engage people through things they love to see in their backyard, and it's really that simple. What we are not, I get this a lot, we are not a birding organization. We're not a bird watching organization. Yep, I love to watch birds. Love it, do it all the time. I don't go to work every day and watch birds. I go to work every day to conserve birds so people can enjoy and watch them. And we can keep habitat on the landscape for these birds. That's our goal, not to sit in our back porch and watch birds. We use them as a catalyst for landscape scale conservation. End of story. So recently, uh, and, and many of you probably don't know this because this came out September 7th, we launched our climate change initiative. Finally, Audubon <laughs> got with the program, right? It's taken us a while, but I will tell you why. September 7th, we launched our climate change bird report, speaking specifically through the eyes of our feathered friends. What we found was nearly half of our birds are going to be on the brink of extinction by 2080, due to climate change. By when? 2080. 2080. This is a burrowing owl. They exist in Colorado. If you've ever been to Pawnee National Grasslands, you will see these little buggers, cutest things ever. We're looking by 2080 that we could lose 70 7% of its breeding range, 77%. The climate port report basically took 588 species of birds, and we used two databases, Audubon's Christmas Bird Count, or CBC. They do one here in Boulder, the chapter does if you're interested, and the uh, North American Breeding Bird Survey. But we use these databases because they have such a longevity to them. They're 30 plus years old. We went back to 1960 through 2010, I think. So we used three decades of observations, and then we took 17 different variables of temperature and precipitation. I'm not going to get into those variables. It's a modeling deal and statistics. It's uninteresting. Um, but what it showed, and, and then we took greenhouse gas emissions, and we mapped three different scenarios. If we stay on track exactly where we are today, if we increase our emissions, or if we decrease our emissions, what's going to happen to 588 different species of birds in the U.S.? <clears throat> well, not such good news. Nearly half of them, 314 species, are expected to lose 50% of their range by 2080. 50%. Of those 126, we termed climate endangered, meaning by 2050, so 30 years earlier, they're going to be losing. They've already lost 50% of their range. And then the other 188 species by 2080. So tack on 30 more years. Yep, they've lost it too. They're, we call them climate threatened. We have a little bit more wiggle room with them. Just to give you some examples, and these are all birds you could see in the great state of Colorado. Greater sage grouse, some of you may be familiar with this bird. <laughs> it's in the press a lot. Not gunnison, this is greater sage grouse, different species. We are predicted to lose 71% of its breeding range by 2080. 71%. This is a bird that's already threatened. It's up for listing in September two, 2015. Why? energy development. And I'm going to talk about that just briefly later. American Dipper, yay, the water oozel. This is a water quality indicator species. We use all these birds as indicators. How is our health of our habitats? How's the health of our landscapes doing? This one tells you exactly how your rivers are doing. We've gone some sagebrush to our riparian ecosystems. Water oozels, or the American Dipper, is only supposed to hold 12% of its summer range by 2080. 12%. We've just lost our indicator for our rivers. 
I know, I, f I feel like a Debbie Downer today. I will get to a, a high point. Marsh wren, moving out kind of into the wetlands, off the river a little bit, into those soppy wet areas, 74% loss. You're getting the picture. And golden eagle, mm, such a beautiful bird. Kind of crosses a lot of habitats, right? You're in the, the badlands and the prairies, the sagebrush. You also see them in riparian zones. You see this bird all the time. I'm sure you have seen golden eagles just driving between here and Denver. You can see them along the I-25 corridor, frighteningly enough. <clears throat> and again, we are losing 40%, 41% of their habitats as well. The birds are talking to us. This is just another way we can engage people. We can let them see what is going on. We can talk about economics. We can talk about you know, social structure. And we can talk about the biology. And birds are an easy way of talking about it. They are the heartbeat for this planet. They are the heartbeat for this planet. They don't stay in one spot. They migrate up and down, east and west as well. They're telling us already something is very drastically wrong. We've got to do something. Do you like to see those birds in your backyard? That's what I always tell people. Do you like to see your birds in your backyard? Well, then join me. Let's talk about climate for a minute. All this is to say, we, Audubon is really looking at taking the helplessness out of it. You know, we can spend all day talking about the dire examples, just like I put up there. It's kind of depressing. Um, but it really isn't helpless. We can do so many things. We can come together and really make a difference. And that's what Audubon is doing through the lens of birds. Our goal is to keep habitat on landscape scales on the ground, really and truly. It's not specifically about one bird or another bird. We just use them to save our habitats. And we use the appeal of birds to engage a really diverse audience. <clears throat> Again, getting back to our network, you know, just getting all those different partner organizations, all of our chapters, all of our centers, the readers of the magazine, we have an incredible reach. This is one, <laughs> isn't that cute? That's just damn cute. Um, really telling, someone was listening to a talk and said, you know, I knew that climate was a problem. Pretty obvious now. But one, when you talked about the birds, it hit home for me. It hits home for a lot of people, right? And that they feel like they can do something. Audubon, Audubon is trying to ignite our grassroots base into action, whether it's through our Habitat Heroes program and changing your, your half of your yard to a bird bee and butterfly you know, garden instead of a Kentucky bluegrass. Let's use all our water out of our western rivers to water your lawn, or taking political action. There's steps everywhere and in between. <clears throat> That's our website, climate.audubon.org. This is one of our educators letting a, a towhee go from a little boy, and we engage in kids as well, because they are our future. One thing I really want to point out today is you all are here to talk about solutions, and that's where we need to go. We all know it's an issue, and this is just another, birds are just another entry point. Use us. Use this. We want you to. We want to partner and get it out to the grassroots. And I will say this, when you're deliberating today and thinking about what you're going to push forward, remember the first law of physics. For every action, there is a reaction, right? It's basically, in a nutshell, the first law of physics. So when you thought, start talking about renewable energy, solar, wind, natural gas, I did my master's on natural gas and the impacts of greater sage grass. It has impacts. Wind has its impacts. Solar has its impacts. Not that Audubon or myself are against any of those renewables. That's where we need to move. But also remember that we have to push forward responsible development as well. You just can't put a wind farm up anywhere you want and think it's all good because we're going to reduce our carbon emissions. It ain't. Transmission lines come along with it to get the energy from that wind power, from that wind down the line. And it has huge impacts on our bird species and our landscape. Again, 
not poo-pooing the idea, just saying we have to also push that siting and make sure that when we do develop our renewables, which we've got to move to, that we're doing it correctly. So that's all. That's it. I think I stayed on time. <laughs> Thank you, Allison.